Hey, good morning, everybody. Just want to welcome you guys out to the emergency vehicle operators course. This is the, uh, the first part of the course that you have to take. And this includes basically all of the, uh, the didactic portion. This is all the uh, kind of the everything except for the driving is going to be included online today. All right, guys, so this is the emergency vehicle operator course. This course is the uh, EVOC course that has been um, regulated. It is the uh, official EVOC course. It's by the Department of Transportation. The US Department of Transportation puts this course on. For folks who are gonna be driving an emergency vehicle, um, the EVOC course is pretty specific um, to ambulances, but also, um, can, can work pretty well for a, a wide variety of emergency vehicles, like uh, quick response units, for example. Um, we also have a firefighting version of this that's a little bit different. Um, this is not that course, so we're not gonna be driving any kind of a uh, fire apparatus today. We're gonna be sticking with uh, ambulances, as a matter of fact. So let's kind of get started and learn a little bit about the EVOC course and um, what we're gonna be learning today. All right, so here we go. Introduction, so the goal is to provide ambulance operators with knowledge and skills to operate their vehicles so that the vehicle equipment crew and patients will be delivered safely and efficiently and the safety of the public will be assured during all phases of EMS involving the ambulance. And so really in a nutshell, what this is really talking about is we wanna make sure that what we're doing is that we are getting out there and getting the job that, that the public has really um, asked us to do. Oh, this thing is really being kind of slow. I'm just going to step over here. As we want to make sure that we're doing that job effectively, and we want to make sure that we're doing it safely. Um, that's really, really important as we want to make sure that we're doing a, a good, safe job. And so by doing that, is the whole reason that we have EVOC is to make sure that, because one of the most dangerous things is just... my new phone is fucking big enough. <laughs> I heard you got a new phone. I think it's important for us to um, be reminded that um, we want to make sure that we're doing everything well. And so the best way to, to make sure that we're doing things well, hang on just a second. I have a little audio trouble here this morning. Anyway, we want to make sure that we are um, doing whatever we need to and doing it well really is um, just being able to perform our job daily is we should think about how dangerous it is for us to operate an emergency vehicle. So we're gonna learn about the legal aspects of ambulance operation, including appropriate vehicle procedures based upon federal, state, local, and organization regulations do regard true emergencies, negligence. And uh, we're definitely gonna be talking about things like abandonment, good Samaritan provisions and patient rights. Um, all of that kind of, I know you're thinking, well, this is a driving course. What does that have to do with anything? Well, we're gonna be placing these people in our vehicles and we wanna make sure that they understand that they have rights, that they have rights, whether they wanna go to the hospital, rights that they don't wanna go to the hospital and different things about treatment as well. We're gonna learn about the different types of ambulances, different operations, including general guidelines about weight restrictions and operation. We're gonna talk about readiness, believe it or not. Uh, one of the first things we do besides uh, 
checking off our truck and all the gear in it is it should be the truck itself. Um, we should be doing daily inspections, maintenance, and um, to a certain extent, repair. And I'm not talking about anything that's really extensive or anything. We're going to talk about you know, a little bit of repair things that most people should be able to perform. We're going to talk about normal and high-risk driving situations. And the appropriate driving skills for situations from routine traffic, their hazardous weather, and of course, traffic conditions. We're going to talk about safety considerations for ensuring the safety of passengers, patients, and their family, the ambulance and the crew, as well as the general public. This course will not cover pursuit driving or high speed operation of an ambulance. All right, that's really more on the law enforcement side. The DOT recommends operating at a or below the posted speed limits and getting to the scene safely. So this course is designed for new hires or experienced operators who want refresher training. Um, folks who work in a larger um, cities or even small towns or belong to paid professionals or volunteer organizations. So really this course is designed for everyone. Um, everybody who works with an emergency vehicle can definitely benefit from this course today. So before you were hired or you volunteered somewhere or wherever you're coming from, your overall qualifications were reviewed. This review may have included driving record checks, medical checks, and vocational tests. So you have to make sure that you are maintaining your driver qualifications. This includes keeping your license up to date and valid reporting any violation you receive when driving your personal vehicle. All right, so is it possible from time to time for us to get a ticket? Absolutely. Um, but can, if you start getting points and things on your license, could this affect where you work at? And that job, and that answer is absolutely as well. We have to remain physically and mentally fit to make sure that we're operating an emergency vehicle because we have to make sure that we are functioning at our optimal level to make sure that we're able to operate the vehicle safely. Participate in training when available. And we have quite a bit of driver training that we've been doing lately. Um, we have our own um, driver training that we do here with our employees, but we also have a defensive driving course. And we also are teaching EVOC. And so take advantage of those courses that are out there and uh, get that training. All right, so here we go on to the next part. Now we're really going to get into the legal aspects of ambulance operation. And we really don't think about it too much other than we think about legal aspects of driving our, our car as, okay, if I get into to an accident, you know, I may have to, to, to pay for that or, you know, I have to put it on my insurance or, you know, um, getting a speeding ticket or anything. But what we do in an ambulance can be very, very dangerous, not only to ourselves, the patient, but also to the general public. And so we've got a huge responsibility of what we need to be, be looking at. And so one of the things that we need to make sure is that we understand what the law says. We wanna make sure that we understand the consequences to those laws. So the goal for this portion of today is to provide you guys with knowledge of the federal, state, and local laws and how to apply the laws when operating an ambulance. As an ambulance operator, you are responsible for the safe and efficient transportation of your patients and crew. At the same time, you must also look out for the safety of the public. And that's, that's a lot of folks to be looking out for. And so there's a, quite a bit of a burden for us to be able to do that. And so it takes special people to be able to operate these vehicles. It takes specialized training, and it also takes somebody that actually cares to be able to perform all of this stuff like we need to. So there's the three types of laws that we're going to look at. The first one is called constitutional law. All right, and this is going to be the federal policies, but it can also um, straight down to state and local um, policies, which could be statutory laws, ordinances, rules, and regulations. All right, we're going to talk about the different types of laws, all right? So we're going to go back for just a second on this. A constitutional law is anything that's going to relate to the federal constitution. These are going to be federal laws. These are going to be constitutional laws. Statutory laws are going to be state laws. These are laws that are enacted 
by uh, different states. Um, for example, here in North Dakota, um, all of our driving laws and everything are based off of the century code. And this, the century code is gonna be the statutory laws, those are the state laws. But as well, we can also have um, ordinances specific to the cities and things that we, we run into. And there can be different guidelines for different cities that we come into. And so it's really important for us to understand that, yeah, we need to follow the federal law, we need to order, run under the state law as well as those local ordinances, but we also have to abide by the rules and regulations of the company. And you're saying, well, you know, if I don't have to always follow the rules and regulations of the company, well, yeah, you do. For example, if you were to have an accident and you were violating company policy while you were doing that, um, that may not provide you with a lot of protection in court and be like, hey, this person was trained. They knew that this was, um, was wrong in what they were doing and they violated organizational policies. We've had, the company has policies in place to protect our staff and everything. So it's important to follow the guidelines. It's not only does it protect the public, but it can protect you as well. So here are some exemptions. Ambulance operators are subject to all traffic regulations unless a specific exemption is made in the state or local statutes. And that can include um, giving us a certain amount of, of, of speed that we can exceed over the posted speed limit, um, being able to, uh, to run lights and sirens and being able to, um, to go through those. Exemptions are legal only while operating in the emergency mode. So um, if you're not in the emergency mode, you have to drive just like everybody else does. So if those lights and sirens aren't on, you have to drive just like everybody else and you have to follow the, 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 same, the same guidelines. Even with an exemption, operators can be found criminally or civilly liable if involved in a crash. And this is um, really important to understand. I wanna go back over this point one more time. Even with an exemption, even though the, the state can say, okay, well, you can go 20 miles over the speed limit, post the speed limit on the interstate, blah, blah, blah. You were involved in a crash. You still have to operate with due regard. And we're gonna talk about that here in just a second. Because you can still be found criminally or civilly liable if involved in a crash. And so we wanna make sure that we are operating our vehicle in a safe and efficient manner. All right, so here's the law of due regard, and this is pretty simple. What it says, it says a reasonably careful person performing similar duties and under similar circumstances would act in the same manner. And a good way to figure this out is if you were in a crash, you're going to go um, to court. How they're gonna find if you were driving with, within the law of due regard is they're gonna find somebody with a similar background and a similar training and they're gonna ask them if they would do the same thing that you did. Now, if you are pretty certain that that same person is gonna say yes, then you are driving within due regard. However, if you are pretty certain that person is gonna say no, you are driving without due regard. So the best thing to do is to drive with due regard. All right, so here is a little bit of a better breakdown, or excuse me, a breakdown of the law of due regard. So the first thing, am I responding like others would in the same situation? Am I giving enough notice of my vehicle's approach to allow other motorists and pedestrians to clear a path and protect themselves? Am I using the signaling equipment appropriately? Is it necessary to use it? Can motorists and pedestrians hear and see my signals? So when we're operating our emergency vehicle in the emergency mode, we've got our lights and our sirens going, you still got to use your turn signals. <laughs> I know this is a hard concept for some folks. You still have to make sure that we're communicating with our other drivers. Um, and so is there other ways to communicate? Absolutely, we come up to an intersection and folks are confused. We need to give our intentions of what we need to do. Am I using extreme caution? I must never travel at a speed that does not permit complete control of my vehicle. If you are not in control of your vehicle, you are in the wrong. 
So what is a true emergency situation? And oh my gosh, man, this, this, um, we can have hours of debate over this one. And so I'm gonna to try to help, try to break this down as, as easy as I can. Because the other day I was sitting in the day room here where I work and um, was talking to some folks about when about driving non-emergency versus emergency and about being safe. And so a true emergency situation, here's what this says, involves high probability of death or serious injury to an individual in action by the operator may reduce the seriousness of that situation. And that means that we driving at the speed, the, you know, the increased speeds, running our lights, our sirens and everything, is that by getting there, that the chances that we take by getting there and the risks that we take are going to benefit that patient. Now, if we can still have a same outcome by driving non-emergency, which one do you think is going to be the better? And that answer, of course, is driving non-emergency. So a true emergency situation, is there a high probability of death or serious injury to the patient? Will my actions reduce the seriousness of the incident? And if there is a yes to both of those, then yes, we should be running emergency. But if one of those answers is no, then we should absolutely not run emergency. Um, we should reduce our, our speed and, and drive a little bit better. So negligence, um, this is most definitely a place where you don't wanna be as in a court of law. Um, is negligence is any action which violates a standard of practice or care. So can we be negligent when we're driving? Well, yes, absolutely. We can be absolutely negligent. And the reason that we can be negligent is because um, one of the big things is, is the reason that we can become negligent is um, we have to ask ourselves, did we violate a standard of practice or care? If we have been driving and not doing a good job of driving, we're gonna be negligent. Um, we're gonna be negligent because we've exceeded um, maybe the law when it comes down to the posted speed limit. We could be negligent because we weren't in control of the vehicle. We can be negligent because of how we were driving. So negligence, to figure out negligence, we have to figure out these things. The first thing, do I have a duty to act toward the other person? And so if you're working for an agency or whatever, even volunteering and everything, as soon as that alarm goes off and they have identified your unit and everything, you have a duty to act. You've been contacted to respond to this person, you have a duty to act. And so the next thing is, what must I do to avoid a breach of duty? For example, you must not fail to respond, all right? A breach of duty saying that, um, I have a duty to act, and the breach of that is saying that, well, you know, I knew that I was supposed to run that call, and I didn't, would be an example of that. But also negligence could be for a breach of duty is um, not doing the things that we need to do. So the last thing is, is how can I avoid the other person suffering injury or loss because of my duty? The actual cause of the other person's injury or loss must be a direct result of a breach of duty, such as a violation of a traffic regulation. And so we have a duty to respond and we have a duty to respond safely. And if we go outside of that, then we are in a breach of duty. And if it causes injury or illness to this person, then we can be held responsible under negligence. Abandonment. Abandonment is the act of refusing to transfer or terminating transportation prior to believing or being relieved by other qualified healthcare providers. And this is basically where it's real simple. We've abandoned them. As uh, we want to make sure that that patient, all right, if we are going to be leaving the scene, that they have signed a refusal. We want to make sure that they are taken care of, that they're in good shape. But also, we want to make sure that um, if we are turning over duty, if we were the first responding unit and then a, a transporting unit comes in, we want to make sure that they're, they're the same level or higher level before we turn that care over. 
So the Good Samaritan provision, and so this one actually causes quite a bit of uh, confusion. So the Good Sam provision protects persons who give aid at the scene of an emergency from liability for additional damage or injury. So does that cover all of us in EMS if we respond to an emergency that we're never going to get sued because of the Good Sam provision? Uh, no. <laughs> what the Good Sam was designed for was for lay people, all right, or volunteers who are acting in good faith when they are responding to an emergency. Um, the Good Sam would, let's say that you're off duty and you see a car wreck on the side of the road and there's a, the car's on fire and you pull the, the victim out and they are injured as you're pulling them out of the fire. Well, the Good Sam Law would cover you, number one, because you're, you're, not, in, you're not in within professional duty. You're not responding in, in an ambulance by being paid or a volunteer. It's going to give you that protection because you were acting in good faith being able to use that. Now, when we are acting as professionals, like here at Metro, if one of the crews goes out and they respond to an emergency, the Good Samaritan Act is not going to cover them, all right? It's because they are professional rescuers. They're acting professionally and we're called out professionally. Um, they're going to have to use good judgment. So make sure you understand a little bit about the Good Sam provision and what it covers and doesn't cover. Patients' rights. They have the right to consent. With consent also means that a patient has the right to refuse treatment. And that can be like, hey, I want to ride to the hospital, but I don't want an IV. Um, they can tell you they don't want to go to the hospital. And then we also have to make sure that, that with consent, you know, when a person wants to refuse or whatever, is they have to be alert and oriented times four, which means they have to have a Glasgow Coma Scale score of 15. If it's anything less than 15, they cannot... Um, um, refuse medical treatment because we have to go with implied consent to make sure that they are covered. The patient has rights with confidentiality as we want to make sure that we are taking care to preserve um, all of their protected information and their privacy as well. So let's take a look at consent and we're going to take a look at respect, witness, and document. And these are the three things that we really want to do is when it comes down to making sure that we are making sure that we do a good job of consent. The first thing is respect. The respect the patient's right to refusal. Do not restrain patients who have refused treatment. Don't demand that they be treated or argue with them concerning the treatment. However, we want to make sure that that patient understands, and you'll see this is how I write my refusals and everything. I always write that the patient understands the the reasons why they should go to the hospital, the reasons why there are risks associated with them not going into the hospital. And so when they understand the risk and everything and they sign that they understand that risk, it's gonna protect you as a provider as going, hey, we explain that, yeah, we would be more than happy to take this person to the hospital for that cut over their eye. And we explained it why they need to go is because if it was enough of an injury to, to cut their eye, there may be underlying tissue that could be damaged or they could have a head injury. And all of the things that we need to do is we explain it to them. Or what if you have a patient that does want to go to the hospital with you, but they're like, hey, I'm scared of needles. Please don't start an IV on me. That is absolutely within their right to do that. But we should explain to them, hey, here's the thing. If your, your condition starts to deteriorate, I'm going to be able to give medication faster through this IV. All the things that we need to tell them is giving them an opportunity, which is called informed consent, is that they are consenting to treatment or refusal based off of us informing them of the good things and the bad things that go along with it. Witness. Have someone witness that your EMS team has offered care and that the patient refused. Um, if there is somebody to witness, absolutely get them to witness your, um, the refusal. Law enforcement is great for getting them to sign for refusal. But if the absolute last person that you should get to sign is your partner, unless there's nobody else available to do so. Document that your EMS team offered care and that the patient refused. Report immediately to dispatch for the refusal of care. And so it's when you're going back in service, say, um, 
you know, 6141 is back in service, um, patient refuse treatment and transport is having that. So it is documented, it's time stamped, that everybody knows what's going on. So patients have rights in regards to confidentiality. So the first thing is, is we don't speak to the press, your family, friends, or other members of the public about the services provided. And this can be a tough one, um, especially when it comes down to family and friends, is because they are super interested in what we do. Why, I have no idea, but they are. They, uh, they are really interested in kind of what we do here. And so what we wanna do is make sure that we don't inadvertently release patient information. I do not relate specifics about what a patient may have said, who the person was or was with, anything unusual about the patient's behavior or any descriptions of personal appearance. Now, when I worked in a bigger city, this was real easy to do. But one of the things is, is moving to a small place, especially I worked at um, some rural places here in North Dakota. And folks would know about what happened before I would, you know, it would get out so quickly. I'd be at the gas station. And the gas station attendant would be asking me about it. And, you know, everybody else, well, isn't that so-and-so who wrecked their tractor down there? And I'm like, ah, you know, I'm not sure. And it was hard to play that off sometimes, but we still have to make sure that we are maintaining confidentiality. It is one of the patient rights. So some other legal issues. Number one, we are responsible for the passenger's possessions. Um, if the passenger brings it in the ambulance, it leaves with them. And so sometimes we have to get turned around and go take that stuff back. Failure to report crashes or using improper reporting procedures. Exceeding load capacity of the vehicle, um, we must follow weight restrictions. Failure to conduct or record vehicle inspections. Failure to provide training. Um, we must not operate any vehicle that the operator has not completed operator training. Um, so we don't want to just throw people to the wind and, you know, within our organizations and making sure that we want to make sure that they're trained up. Um, the time to uh, learn how to do emergency driving is not when it's their, their first call. <laughs> All right. We want to make sure that we're one of the first things that we should identify and things that we should do for these folks is to make sure that we are training them. And where you can have failures in maintaining training records is uh, we want to have training records and we have to keep those for quite a bit of time, honestly. All right, so here's our first scenario. You're returning from a run when a car pulls up beside you while you're stopped at a traffic light. The individual informs you that there is a three vehicle crash that has just occurred on the nearby interstate. No other emergency vehicles are at the scene. The individual informs you that several of the victims are trapped in the cars. The severity of the injuries is unknown. Is this a true emergency situation and why? The answer is this is a true emergency because so little information is known about the injuries or about any other circumstances, the operator must assume the true emergency. In this case, the operator is determining the nature of the emergency. Always call the dispatcher and tell them about the situation and get instructions. All right. So yes, because a true emergency does exist, the ambulance operator is complying with the statute using signaling equipment while violating the normal direction of movement. So when we do have a true emergency, we can um, follow within the guidelines of operating an emergency vehicle during an emergency. Right, we get out of these things, these are kind of crazy. All right, so here's our summary. Operators should not operate under emergency response conditions unless a true emergency exists. We can't. We can't just uh, go, okay, well, you know, um, there's a, a, just somebody who would like a ride to the hospital. No, that's not a true emergency. We want to make sure that we are following under the guidelines of what a true emergency is. Operators need to think safety to avoid negligence charges. So the more safe that we are when we're driving, the more likely it is that we're going to avoid any kind of unhappy things that can happen in court. Operators have an obligation to continue to provide care until relieved by other care providers. Once the operator begins the patient provider relationship. So once we start care, 
We either have to finish that care off to a, a hospital or we have to turn it over to the same level of training or higher. Patients have rights as consent and confidentiality in medical emergency situations and also in non-emergency situations. All right, lesson three. Lesson three is we're gonna be talking pretty specifically about communication and reporting because it is part of operating an emergency vehicle. So the goal is to provide participants with knowledge of the communication roles and responsibilities and protocols for receiving and sending messages. So routine reporting points. So the first thing is the pre-run, all right? So the pre-run is when we are getting into the truck, we're communicating, um, we're making sure that our vehicle is ready to go. So when dispatched, we want to make sure that we get the information that we need, uh, specifically the address, any information that we, we need, such as the nature of the illness or injury, and any other information that may be pertinent to, as we're going. Uh, we want to make sure that we are communicating upon scene arrival, is making sure that everybody knows that we're on the scene at the scene to give an update if we need to. Before scene departure, we wanna make sure that we are letting folks know exactly where we're going. En route to the medical facility or destination, we're gonna to have to actually call the hospital and let them know that we are on our way. Once we've arrived at the medical facility, we're gonna to have to communicate with them to let them know about the patient. And again, we're gonna to have to communicate just to get back in service. And all of this is part of our normal operation. So the operator responsibility, and you notice today that we're going to be talking as, to you as operators and not as drivers, or right? you're not a driver, you know, it's one of the things that a lot of uh, EMS folks get really uptight about is uh, when you get called an ambulance driver, everybody's like, oh my God, I'm not an ambulance driver. Um, but driving the ambulance is part of what we do. And so um, people go, are you an ambulance driver? And I'll be like, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> So we have to kind of take that with a grain of salt. But our operator responsibility is, is the safe and efficient operation of that vehicle. That's what our job is, is we want to make sure that we're operating that vehicle safely. We only communicate during non-driving points when possible. And there are going to be times when we're going to be by ourselves up front that we may have to communicate with dispatch and different things. Yes, but we want to try to eliminate that especially when we're driving in the emergency mode, all right? So if you're driving and we're on our way to a call, your passenger, all right, and your, your partner who is over there in the passenger seat should be doing all the communicating and everything and, and doing the mapping and they should be talking to dispatch and they should be entering all the stuff in on the computer and everything. That's their job. The operator responsibility is to drive that vehicle. So operator information. So some of the things that we're gonna have as basics that we're gonna to need to get started on this call is the address. We gotta know where the hell we're going. So we gotta have that address. But the next thing we're gonna to have to know is the description or nature of the call because that's going to let us know is this a true emergency or not? Because that's gonna let us know do we have the right to respond emergency or not? So sending messages. All right, so with the radio, you need to know um, what each radio channel is and know what it is used for and when to use it. All right, is this channel used for your specific company operations? Is this one talking to state or different officials? Is this one talking to the hospital, et cetera? So remember, patient privacy and do not communicate personal information over the radio. All right, and I still hear um, big agencies that do this, and um, this is a huge HIPAA violation. Um, we cannot give um, the patient name. However, the patient address may come over the radio. However, that's perfectly fine is, is we don't just say, hey, Jim Jones at 9341 County Line Road. We can't say that, all right? Um, we can't give the patient social security number or any identifiable thing. So when sending a message, when we're composing our message, um, whether it's um, we're using the, the, the radio to communicate or we're using our cell phone to communicate with the hospitals and things, 
And the first thing is we want to plan our message. We want to have, we want to know exactly what we're going to say before we say it. Identify the person called and then the calling unit. All right. Yes. Yeah, so we would be uh, Sanford Hospital 6141. Be brief and concise. Use plain English. All right. So avoid all those 10 codes. Pronounce words clearly. Spell phonetically. All right. So phonetically is going to be the Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta kind of stuff. Repeat directions. All right. As we want to make sure that we're having clear communication and that we're doing well when confirming all of this stuff up and everything. Plain English, English message, so use affirmative instead of yes. Use negative instead of no. Um, use, instead of saying 50, say 50. Instead of 15, say 15. And this is going to help us to be able to communicate effectively and also to keep us from making some, some mistakes that can happen so we don't have some accidents. So here is the phonetic alphabet, and so it's Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, Golf, Hospital, India, Juliet, Kilo, Lima, Mike, November, Oscar, Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Tango, Uniform, Victor, Whiskey, X-Ray, Yankee, and Zulu. That is how we spell things out, is to make sure um, so there's no um, confusion. So here's the thing. So sending messages, we use the phonetic alphabet, and so Smythe Street would be Sierra, Mike, Yankee, Tango, Hotel, Echo, Smythe. You know, because it could also be, um, if it's, the way it's look, it could be, um, so we could say Smith, and it could be Smythe Street. And so th there's a lot of different ways that that could be spelled, as we want to make sure we have the proper spelling, and that's why it's important to use the phonetic alphabet so for radio transmission, the first thing we need to do is to listen. Listen to the frequency to be sure it is clear of traffic. If others are talking, wait for them to sign off before using that frequency. Just making sure that that traffic's clear. Depress the microphone key. Press the microphone transmit key for a half second before speaking. If you're too quick to begin talking, your first word or syllable may be cut off. So give it a second. Talk with your mouth close to the microphone, but not completely in the microphone. Keep your mouth close to the microphone, no more than one and a half inches away, so it's really nice and clear. Clear the frequency when you finish. The word out is a standard way to signal the end of a radio transmission. A lot of times we don't really use that so much. All right, so lesson four is going to be on ambulance types and operation. So give me just a half second here, and we'll get started. All right, so let's take a look at the different types of um, ambulance types and some of the operations with it. So the first thing is the star of life. And believe it or not, this thing actually, um, there's reasons why this is important to have within there. The star of life emblem may be displayed on the ambulance when the manufacturer certifies to the purchaser that the ambulance, its components and equipment meet or exceed the test in the triple K specification. So a good way to uh, kind of mess with your friends and everything and be like, hey, do you know that every ambulance in the United States has KKK in it? And they'll be like, uh, no, it doesn't. We're like, yeah, it does. There's a stamp and a sticker that even says that. And it's a triple K standard. 
So triple K A 18, 22 Charlie is a federal specific standard published by the General Services or the GSA that recognizes three types of ambulance, type one, type two, and type three. A type one ambulance is a conventional truck, cab chassis with modular body ambulance. All right, um, so we see that on there. All right, and so a type one has that truck cab at the front of it. Um, service capacity can be for both BLS and ALS, and the classes is a class one or two rear wheel drive class or a two to four wheel drive chassis. A type two ambulance, which is what we're going to be um, kind of using the next couple of days to do our EVOC road test, is a standard van with an integral cab body ambulance. Um, it can be, of course, ALS or BLS, event, and it can also be rear wheel drive class with either a two or four wheel drive. Class three is what a lot of our ambulances are here. And so with the class three ambulance, um, it's a, a cutaway van cab chassis with integral or uh, containerized modular body ambulance. Um, some people refer to these as mini mods. Um, they can also serve ALS or BLS capabilities. They are a class one or two rear wheel drive, or they can also be four wheel drive as well. No matter what type of ambulance um, you drive, you must know your ambulance's weight restrictions in order to operate safely during all driving conditions. Um, so this is really important is to understand that even though it looks like a van or it looks kind of like a little truck, it's not. Um, it's really, really heavy. You have to consider all of the cabinets, all of the equipment and everything in there. And so I heard a, one of my friends here this morning, we were kind of discussing some of this, and he made a really good analogy and everything. And we were talking about just kind of how motors and things work on the ambulance. And it was like, if more people thought about when they're driving an ambulance, it's like pulling an RV, um, they would do a lot better. And I was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. So size, an ambulance is larger than a standard car. It is wider, longer, and taller, which makes it harder to maneuver. The ambulance width and length affects turning, and its height means you must be aware of height clearances. Um, over the years, I've been in EMS way too long, and I can't tell you how many times I have had to do incident reports um, because my partner has drove us through a drive through and we've gotten stuck at Hardee's or Taco Bell or whatever and scratched a truck, and then so make sure you understand how tall you are. And this also includes parking decks. Um, we had a hospital there in Birmingham that was UAB, and I can't tell you how many times um, because there was a low clearance and we'd have an ambulance that would get, you know, stuck under an overhang. We'd have to go try to figure out how to get it out. So make sure you understand the size differences. An ambulance may weigh more than a car. It weighs a lot more than your car. It takes a lot, it takes longer to accelerate and brake. And so I'll see folks and they'll, they'll get in an ambulance and they just like, oh man, this thing isn't going very fast. Well, this thing's like four times every in your car. Of course, it's not going to um, accelerate the way your Honda Civic does, all right? This thing's going to accelerate like a thick, like a huge truck. It's going to take a lot longer to brake as well. So you're going to need more room to brake and you're going to have to make sure that you got a plan for acceleration. Visibility is one of the biggest issues that we have when driving is blind spots, and there are tons of them when it comes to an ambulance. Um, you have to rely on your side mirrors. Even if most ambulances and newer ones nowadays, they have the rear view cameras and all of that stuff, but that will absolutely get you in trouble, folks, when it comes down to using that stuff is because it's not accurate. Um, so you have to be careful. But whenever possible, when you are backing up, you should always use a ground guide. Any questions? All right, we'll keep on going. We're gonna talk about vehicle inspections, maintenance and repair. And so this is kind of a big one when we start talking about EVOC because we just don't think about um, doing vehicle inspections. I know for here and everything, the first thing I do when I come up to work is I go, and I inspect the things that mean the most to me, which is the patient care equipment. I don't really think about checking the truck, but I do it a lot more now is because I'm like, well, I do this stuff for my car before I go on a long trip. I check the oil, I make sure that my, everything looks good before I do that. But 
am I more likely to get in an, in an accident, you know, for me driving on a, a 10 hour trip to Yellowstone or driving emergency around here in Bismarck? Well, the likelihood is, is I'm more likely gonna get in an accident around here. And so little inspections and stuff can really help us to make sure that our vehicle is in a good condition for us to be able to get out on the road. So isn't it better for us to take a look at the tires and see if they're getting worn down, if there's wear on it before it splits on us on the side of the road? I would much rather take five minutes to look around the tires now than to have to be on the side of I-94 in wintertime changing a tire out in the middle of nowhere. So look at that stuff, it's important. Uh, so let's take a look at some of our basic vehicle stuff. So we have to make sure that we are operating that vehicle in safe operating condition, which includes inspecting the vehicle according to established procedures. Every organization should have some type of protocol and procedures on what has to be checked daily. If your organization doesn't have that, I would highly recommend that you do have that is because it's gonna be the saving grace when something happens. So um, let's say that vehicle breaks down or whatever, and we've got vehicle maintenance records that we've been checking it and stuff, and it's just a vehicle failure, then we've acted within due regard and made sure that we have inspected that vehicle and it's working correctly. If we don't have that information, then it is feasible that somebody could say, hey, you guys were running a vehicle on the streets that wasn't needed, didn't need to be out there. We wanna check that all scheduled maintenance has been performed. And we wanna also check that all needed repairs have been made. So if there's something that needs to be repaired, we need to get it taken care of. If a vehicle is not in a safe operating condition, you as the operator have the responsibility to take the vehicle out of service until the problems have been fixed. And so everybody's like, oh, I don't wanna do that. They're gonna tell me no. Mm -hmm. You as the operator of that vehicle are held responsible, all right? When you skid up front and you put the key in the ignition and you turn it on, you are saying that I agree that this vehicle is good to go. And if you know that there's something wrong, if the brakes are acting like crap, if the tires are messed up on it, you know that vehicle is not safe. Take it out of service. Don't put yourself, your patient, or the public at risk. So our major mechanical systems is our engine drivetrain, which is gonna include the engine and transmission. Our cooling system, which is the radiator, the braking system, which is the brakes, the rotors, the drums, and all that kind of stuff. The electrical system and your aux power, which is gonna be the, um, typically the inverter that runs all the equipment in the back. Um, it all needs to be functioning. Um, does everything have to work 100% like with some of these little small things? No, but it has to be able to function enough to safely be able to get the job done. Environmental control systems, such as the air conditioning and the heat support equipment. And this is gonna be making sure that, that the lights and everything work in the back of the ambulance so you're able to see that all the plugins work so all of your equipment and stuff can be plugged in. Your support equipment also includes your CAD system, your reporting system, your radio system, and all of that. So inspections, by conducting regular system, systematic vehicle inspections, you're able to find and report problems that need to be fixed. And so for the organization I work for, they prioritize um, things that need to be fixed. And so they can't just jump on every little thing is because the more hours you have on these ambulances, the more um, repairs that are gonna come up is because driving an ambulance is rough on those vehicles. We keep track of preventative maintenance requirements as after so many miles, these vehicles have to come in. Um, they have to get the tires rotated. They have to have the engine oil changed. And we document the overall condition of the vehicle. And so one of the things even here at, at the company that I work for, is there's a checklist we do every day, which is called the rig check. And there are things that are gonna ask about the truck and most of us just check the box. But before you check that box, take a look and make sure everything's functioning like it needs to. So inspection standards, we have to ensure that the vehicle inspections are consistent, thorough and accurate. ETMS organizations develops checklists specific to the organization. There's not a national checklist of the DOT or anything. But maintenance organizations must be able to, to document in writing the servicing maintenance and repair of their vehicles and equipment. And so if we send a, like if you were to go 
to the Honda dealership to, to have your oil change, they're going to give you a little sheet of paper that says, hey, on this date, your vehicle got their oil change, blah, 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 blah. Is that important to keep with your car's records? Yes, and it's very important as an EMS agency that you keep that for there. It's going to show that, yes, we did our due diligence and made sure that we kept up the preventative maintenance for this vehicle. And not only is it going to help us to be able to have good records and be able to look back over things, but if there was an, an issue where this vehicle had a breakdown and it resulted in injury or illness to a patient, we can show, yes, we were very diligent in how we were maintaining our vehicles. Inspection types. Now, most of us as providers are going to be um, pretty comfortable with doing a quick check. This covers those systems that should be checked most often. And that's turning the lights on, making sure all the lights work, that the windshield wipers operate, that we have gas in the vehicle, um, oil in the vehicle, all of those little things that we need. That's a quick check. A full check covers all vehicle systems that can be checked without special equipment or facility. That's where we're doing a good walk around and looking through for everything that we need to look at. The inspection sequence, and this is how we should absolutely do every day as part of our rig check. The first thing is the overall appearance. Does that truck look like it needs to look? And that's real, you know, we look at it and see. Um, and this can be um, done pretty quickly. We look in the operator compartment, and this is when you turn it on, we should make sure that when we turn the vehicle on that there's not the check engine light isn't on, um, that the, there's no other alarms or anything that, that come on that um, all the systems operate like they need to. We check the exterior on the operator side and we'd look at the exterior front and this is where you should make sure that your blinkers and your headlights work. Look in the engine compartment. You should at the very minimum make sure that there is water in the radiator or, or other fluids. We make sure that we have windshield wiper fluid that the oil has been checked. We check the exterior passenger side, the patient compartment, and the exterior of the rear. We want to just kind of do a quick look and make sure that everything looks like it needs to look. We have to follow, your inspection should follow your agency's SOPs. And for the organization that I work for, is it is required every day on our rig check sheet. So you do not do more than you are authorized to do, all right? So some of us are, are pretty mechanically inclined. I'm not. Um, that's why I take everything that I own to, uh, to somebody else and let them do that kind of work because that's what they're good at. Um, I don't, I'm not fixing anything on my car. I'm just going to tell you. Yeah, I just take it somewhere. <laughs> and it's because that's not what I do. I'm just not good at that. And so if you're not an ASC certified mechanic, you should not be tearing down engines at work. All right, you shouldn't be changing the water pump or anything like that. Um, are there little things that we can do to get us back on the road? Absolutely, man. We can change light bulbs. Um, we can do some, some basic maintenance and stuff. And so really, as providers, we should only be doing basic maintenance. Nothing too extensive. I know there's some farmers that work here that, you know, they'll, they'll have the whole thing up on blocks out in the backyard and fixing it. You have to, you have to watch for them, people. Operator negligence, failing to inspect a vehicle thoroughly according to the organization requirements. So if you check the box on one of your forms at your organization and you were on the way to the call and there is obviously like that tire is completely worn out and you drove there and you knew about it and you just failed to do anything about it, you're negligent. And if there was harm to that patient, then you're on the hook for it. So knowingly operating a vehicle with a problem that should have resulted in the vehicle being taken out of service, and this is a tough one, is like, I don't feel like I can honestly be able to, to tell my company to take a vehicle out of service. Well, yes, you do. And not only, <laughs> there's federal regulations that will back you up on it, there's state, there's all kind of statutory stuff. It's the right thing to do is because if that vehicle isn't where it needs to be, it could do harm to that patient. We don't want to do that. Preventative maintenance. It ensures safe, reliable vehicle operations. It's not only for our ambulance and stuff, but it's for your car too. Um, get the thing maintained, all right? Um, most of the vehicles and stuff, you're going to have a little book that's you know, inside the glove compartment. It's usually where you're hiding all that other stuff. It's, on top, it's under there. Just dig around. It's in there. Um, it's going to tell you that you have a maintenance schedule for your vehicle. All right, after so many 
thousands of miles or whatever is going to tell you in addition to that oil change there's other things that have to be inspected on there sometimes the gearboxes have to be inspected um, your transmission has to be serviced and stuff it's part of that of regularly maintaining a vehicle it reduces the total cost of repairs because a five dollar repair to a radiator where you're just missing the plug on it can lead to a six hundred dollar repair if you don't identify it from not checking it and so it's good to to get out there and do that. It's gonna help you to be able to keep your vehicle longer and it's gonna um, reduce that total cost of repairs. All right. Um, how many of you ever see like the, uh, I guess the, uh, the term is the shit box cars, you see them running down the road and everything? I don't know why people keep them is because the repairs have to be ridiculous. There's no, they're, they're constantly, and I, I know some people, um, some friends of mine, they, they, they like building them. They're called shit box racers and stuff and they're they're always cutting up and everything and they're telling me about all the different crap that are constantly having to buy for their vehicles. I'm like, why would you do that? It just doesn't seem like good sense to me. It minimizes major equipment failure, identifying small things, small problems lead to big problems when it comes to vehicles. Let's make sure we're doing our preventative maintenance. Your responsibility as an operator is to document any need maintenance that you find. If there's, there's something that needs to be repaired, you just need to make sure that you let somebody know to make sure the needed maintenance has been completed before you place the vehicle in service. So if something needed to be repaired before we bring it back into service, we have to make sure that it's good to go. You are to perform any maintenance for which your organization makes you responsible. All right. So every organization may have some basic maintenance. So they'll, they'll put you responsible for And a lot of times it's going to be just filling fluids and things like that. Making repairs, you should only perform repairs for which you are trained and authorized. And so if your company has authorized you to change out an engine, then you are <laughs> authorized to change out an engine. But I highly doubt that. Malfunctions during a run. I'd like to tell you that you are never gonna be um, having malfunction with an emergency vehicle. I can't do that. You can only do repairs that you are authorized for is a backup readily available. So all organizations shouldn't just have one vehicle. They should at least have that backup. It may not be that your favorite truck, you know, maybe that one that's a few years older or whatever, but we want to have one and that vehicle also needs to be in good repair as well. So we have to ask ourselves, how quickly can we make the repair? So one of the things that I wish every organization would do, and it's one of my goals here um, with the organization I work for, I think that every person within the organization should be able to do a couple of things. They should be able to safely add engine and transmission fluid to a vehicle and be able to check it. Um, they should be able to check the fluid. They should be able to change out a uh, windshield wipers, be able to change out windshield wiper blades. And the last thing is, is everybody here needs to know how to change a tire. And so the organization I worked for in Birmingham, Alabama, as part as our FTO process, as before they could get cleared to go to the streets, is they had to be able to change tire on an ambulance. And I used to get a lot of back, a lot of back talk, honestly. They're like, why would I ever want to change a tire? Well, if you are on a transfer and that happens, we're going to send you out in the middle of nowhere, all right? So from Bismarck to say Rochester, or we're gonna send you from Bismarck to the other end of Wyoming and everything. There are a lot of places where you're gonna be out in the middle of nowhere without any help for quite a while. And so would you rather be out on the side of the road just hoping that somebody's gonna show up or you're gonna be waiting for your AAA folks to come help you? Or can you just go ahead and change that tire? You've got everything you need. So learn how to make repairs, simple repairs and stuff that can help you out a whole lot. And that's one of the things, it doesn't mean you have to change out every tire every time or whatever, but you need to at least have some basic understanding on how to operate a vehicle. Not only is it gonna help you within your organization, but a lot of folks that work for you, not pointing fingers at anybody, <laughs> millennials, uh, don't know how to change a tire. Um, learn that, it's an important skill, <laughs> it's an important skill. What's the patient's condition? Um, because a, a malfunction that starts happening, if we got a patient that's really ill, all right, and we start noticing that that transmission and stuff started to go out, who do we need to call? Do we need to call AAA? Do we need to call another ambulance to come pick this patient up? 
And so we're going to have to make that choice. And I'm always going to err on the side of caution with that patient and get another unit coming to take over until we get our vehicle up. <laughs> Call the helicopter. That's right. Help us. I'm not waiting too long. Okay, 30 minutes. That's right. Call <laughs> Can the vehicle's electrical system meet the demands made on it during the repair? All right, is um, our vehicles have a humongous electrical system, not only for the emergency lighting, but also for all of the equipment that's in the back. And so we have a big inverter and everything. And so um, our everyday operations are very taxing on the electrical systems of our, of our ambulances. All right, so lesson number six is coming up here in just a second. So I'm going to take a short break and then we'll be right back. All right, so folks, we're going to get back into talking about um, EVOC stuff, and this is navigation and route planning. And so besides being able to just drive to, a, to an emergency, we have to know how to get there. And so this can be uh, quite difficult for a lot of people. And so safety is the most important factor when driving to the scene. As it doesn't do us a whole lot of good, man, if we're running to that respiratory distress, if we cause a four-car accident and kill three kids on the way to this respiratory distress for a smoker who's been smoking for nine million years and is on oxygen and meets us at the front door with both suitcases packed, holding a, a, a stogie in their hand and saying, I think I'm short of breath. We have to drive safely. And um, we have to admit, one of the things that I still enjoy about EMS is driving. It's fun, right? I love turning the lights and sirens on, man. It's just a whole heck of a lot of fun. I like driving emergent. But we can't do it if we're going to kill somebody in the process. So our route planning involves learning the geograph geographic and local conditions. And so... Um, a lot of us who come into EMS are also from the fire service. I got a fire service background. And so we used to ride territory. That was your rookie year, man, is you had to learn the territory for the station that you were assigned to. And knowing territory is knowing like where the streets are and just getting familiar with the area that you're going to serve. And unfortunately in EMS, um, we typically have a really huge response area we're not like at a fire station where i'm only assigned to station five i only have to learn this little part of the city in ems you have to learn everything we have to learn because we are constantly being moved around from different parts and everything and so one of the things that i highly encourage is with our new folks and everything don't let them sit at the station all the time get them out let them drive all right drive around and get to learn territory it's so so important the more familiar that you are with your area, the more effective you're gonna be when it comes down to mapping them. Know the individual characteristics of the area. Like Bismarck is super easy to get around on how it's laid out. Mandan is another story. You get off into Mandan right there into town, real easy to find, man. You know that Collins is gonna be the dividing line. Collins and Maine is gonna kind of set you up on your grid until you get about four streets off of that is where everything kind of like does a little spider web all around. You're going, what the hell? And then none of the, nothing makes sense from there. And the only way that people are going to figure this out is to learn territory. You just have to get out and do it. Know your organization's procedures. Every place is a little bit different. The organization that which I work at is we should be using our CAD as a primary source of navigation. But for me, I tell everybody, not the green line on it. You're going to use your, your source of navigation is really knowing where you're at. All right. And so one of the questions is, is can I use Google to find my way around in your car? Yeah, I do, man. I've got the big Garmin navigation thing over there and I spend extra money on it because I travel a lot. But for that, it's not always accurate. And the second thing is, is you need to use it as an aid to navigation and not your only navigation. And so a lot of everybody around here knows that I like to hike and I like to really get off crazy places in the woods all by myself. And so my aid to navigation, and I've got like all kinds of funky GPS toys and everything that 
hang off on my pack and everything, but my primary source of navigation is orienteering, is knowing where I came from and how to get back, and honestly, is being able to read a map. A map and a compass is really what I use the most. And those are skills that unfortunately have been lost um, as we've gotten more technologically dependent. Getting out, learning territory and stuff is going to help you as, a, as an operator of that vehicle, but also for some of the, the younger folks that are coming up. So route planning, we should minimize our travel time. We should know the shortest route. And that's where GPS can get you in trouble. How many of you try to beat the GPS when it tries to send you around someplace? It goes, hey, if you'll get on the interstate, it's gonna take you to point A to point B. And you're like, well, why is it making me go all the way up there? I know if I just go up to Washington and, and go take a left and go north, I'll be there in five minutes versus the 18 minutes that's gonna get sending me all around Bismarck. And that's why it's so important to not rely on that as a navigation. We wanna minimize our crash exposure. And so the way that we minimize crash exposure is to find routes that are not busy, that are not congested, that don't go through residential areas and things like that as it minimizes our reduction for being in a crash. So allow the operator to focus attention on driving. And that person who is driving, that's the only thing that they should be doing, all right? If you are in the passenger seat, you shouldn't be working on a report on the way to the call. I don't care how behind you are, that couple of minutes isn't gonna catch you up, all right? Your responsibility is, is to navigate to that. You're watching out for other cars and you are the co-pilot. You're advising that driver on what they should be doing. You should be um, utilizing the radio, the computer, or whatever thing that we need to so they can focus on driving. Avoid environmental and construction hazards, all right? So environmental hazards, sometimes we just can't avoid those. We can't avoid the rain, we can't avoid the snow and all that. But if we know that there's a street that's flooded or has a potential to flood and everything, should we avoid that if it's raining? Sure, we should. Um, construction hazards, all right? There are two seasons in North Dakota, man. There is winter and road construction season. That's it. Um, everything else is kind of in the middle. But right now, man, every, as soon as the weather starts to get nice, especially up here in the Midwest, that's when, man, they just really hammer us with lots of road construction. And we should be aware of that um, because there can be roads that are closed down that are inaccessible. And so it's important, hopefully dispatch is getting to that, but if you know about a road that's closed or whatever, should you relay that to everybody else? Absolutely. All right, choose routes that minimize stops and turns, um, especially if we're gonna have a patient in the back or a passenger in the back, like a paramedic that's sitting back here. Um, because turns can be hard, especially on an old fart like me, man. It's hard for me to keep my balance anymore. Avoid intersections. So why should we avoid intersections? The number one cause of fatal ambulance crashes are at intersections. And you're right, you can't trust anybody. And I always laugh, man, because when I first moved to North Dakota, because apparently everybody's an asshole in Birmingham where I drive at. As when I moved up here and you come to a four-way, and Birmingham, a four-way is the first person there, and then it's like a three-to-one shot of how quickly you're going to get through before the other person's coming through. All right? I moved up here, and so everybody's nice up here, which is kind of cool. And I live in Mandan, and there's no secret about that. It's right up the street. There's a four-way stop sign. It's right off of Collins. And everybody is can't drive because they're too busy waving the other person through. So there's basically four people at the intersection all waving at each other. Somebody go, all right? And so we do have that. So I try to avoid you. It's like, yeah, come on through, come on through. I'm always, I'm the one waving, being like, you stop before I did. And I'm, I'm like, not saying hi, I'm saying you stop first. And they're all waving each other. Exactly, they're all waving each other. So avoid the residential streets. Now, why do we want to avoid residential streets? You got it, kiddos or kids, dogs. Um, old folks walking around, because number one, we're not going to be able to drive as fast through there, all right? The speed limits are usually quite low, 15, 20 miles an hour, sometimes lower than that. When we're going through there, there's plenty of uh, traffic hazards and things. But one of the other things is, is people all park on the side of the road in a residential area, and that can cause some blind spots for you while you're driving. 
Um, so folks that are here uh, at our organization, um, one of the things that freaks me out is we're right next door to the meat place and everybody parks on the street in front of it. If you're exiting the parking lot, you have to be real careful, man, because there's a big blind spot. There's a guy with the most ginormous pickup truck. Yeah, he parks like right there. It's like yours, but it's huge. And I can't see around it, you know? And so that's kind of like grandma it out to try to make sure I don't hit anything. So our route planning is we should have a primary and an alternate route. And so not only should we plan on having our direct route that we're going to get there, we should be thinking about, okay, is there another way in case this route is blocked or whatever? And that comes with knowing territory. When planning routes, primary and alternate routes should definitely be identified. And so the reason we have those alternate routes is because it could be road conditions, um, it could be construction, you don't know. It's North Dakota. There could be some drunk guy who has rolled over his cattle trailer and, you know, cows all over the, the road. He need to know an alternative. So know your area. Make sure that we know our primary and alternate route, new construction, local landmarks, or reference points. When we have a new employee that starts here, one of the things that I do is I take them and we drive territory on the very first day that they start. And I show them like some, some of the basic routes around town and where to find things. And so I teach them what's known as Southern navigation. That's because when I came up here, man, you guys all talk about directions and stuff. And man, like y'all all just got compasses and shit walking around with y'all. It's on the east side of the building. I'm like, where's that? But it's on the left or the right. You gotta give me some directions on where things are, all right? Turn right at the McDonald's. I can do that. I know where McDonald's is, all right? And so sometimes it's learning and giving people that direction and stuff. If I'm telling people how to get to the North Station, I don't tell them to, all right, so you're going to go up there and you're going to turn east on 19th Street. I'm going to be like, you're going to go and you're going to see space aliens? Turn right right there and keep on going down. It's the next red light down. Make it easy to understand, all right? And it's just whatever language you speak, man. So if you're the navigation folks in North Dakota, you're talking that east, south, north, west kind of stuff. But when you're talking to a southern guy like me, it's uh, the space aliens and turn right. <laughs> All right. So route planning. We should be aware of following conditions of local roads and streets, damaged potholes, badly rutted roads. This is where riding territory is so important. All right. So if we're over at the east station for the organization I work for, and you're having to go out to the airport, all right, or out toward Lincoln, and you're going down 26th Street, what happens when you come across um, the expressway right there in front of Walmart? There is a hump, and you can't tell it from looking at it unless you know it's there. Um, I was riding with, uh, with somebody when I first started, and I hit that thing going really fast. And as the, the truck was becoming airborne, all I could hear was -na 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 as we're going across the 94. <laughs> and so we want to make sure that people know that. Um, and there's certain streets that are here in Bismarck that you know are really, really bumpy. That's got all the, the dips and things in there. Divide Avenue is, the, I will do whatever I can to avoid that one, um, especially up on the North Hill and all that. That's, that's kind of a rough area. As we're only going to know that by driving territory is getting out there and everything. Expressway utilization policies during rush hour or construction. All right. Um, up here where we're at, we don't really have to worry about that so much. Um, down in Birmingham and stuff, we did have like expressway rules and everything as um, during the hours from about three o'clock in the afternoon to about six o'clock at night, you didn't get on the expressway, man. It was, it was always faster to use the surface street. Know where detours, closed roads are all those speed bumps, dips, and bumps. And one of the things that you have to learn about up here in North Dakota is dips are seasonal. Dips get worse in the winter, right? So you have to know about, what do they call those? The frost bumps and things, yeah. Areas of standing water. Um, we haven't had to really worry about that in the last couple of weeks, but um, we do need to know that there are some streets and things that can hold water a little better than others. Under the train, the viaduct. 
So you need to understand the height restriction of your emergency vehicle, all right? The rule that I think that every organization needs to follow is that there is no emergency vehicle should ever be in a drive-thru, ever. There's two reasons why it's a bad idea. The first reason is, is it's a good way for you to ding something on an ambulance is in a drive-thru really quickly. The second thing is, is if uh, you get a call, you're going to have a hard time getting out of the drive-thru to get back out on the road and everything. So if at all possible, avoid those altogether. But we need to also understand how tall our ambulance is, especially if we're responding to places like clinics and stuff that may have low overhangs and, and different things. Is no one, hey, is it safe for me to drive my ambulance over there? Um, we had nursing homes in Birmingham that if the crew didn't know that it was too low, they would just absolutely run into the awning on them. And so make sure that you know the height of your ambulance. It's important. And make sure you understand that every vehicle has different heights, all right? Um, we've got newer vehicles here within our organization that have the new little new air conditioner right on top of it. Makes it just a wee bit taller. Ten six is the top of the AC, and or is it nine? It's nine eight, nine eight something. It's nine something. I think it's nine eight for that one. But for me, I always add a little bit of extra to make sure, man. You know. So when it's telling you the clearance is at, that's to the top of the body. It does not include any additional accessories. Does it include radio antennas, GPS, or any of that kind of stuff? So be careful. All right. Now we're going to talk about actually driving this thing. Basic maneuvers in normal operating situations. We're going to talk about just, just basic driving. So our road surfaces include asphalt, concrete, dirt, and gravel. And in North Dakota, it's a mixture of all four. All right. <laughs> so be careful out there. Road conditions can include bumps, mud, potholes, bridges, ramps, curves, crowns, water damage, all of this stuff can make how we drive a little more difficult. So driving has an effect on that patient, all right? And so it's great if we get them there quickly to the hospital, but it's not great if we cause them injury on how we drive. So we can cause pain to that patient, all right? If we're slamming on the brakes and everything and they're getting slung all around and stuff, it can cause pain. Do you think that there's a possibility that we could cause a fracture to those patients? Yes, it is, especially the elderly. They have osteoporosis, osteoarthritis. Um, we're, one of the things that people, you'll notice too, as you're putting them in the ambulance, they'll start asking questions about driving, like right off the front. Who's driving? Are you a good driver? And it's not that they're being a jerk. Okay, yeah, all right, yeah. There, there's some of them that are just pains in the asses like that. But a lot of them, it is that they're actually frightened a little bit. Now, how many of you, I'm talking to some providers here in the room with me this morning. How many of you have ever been frightened to get in a truck with a new person? And so, I need a joint. <laughs> so I'm stepping up in the ambulance. And I just see the look of that person who has only been at work as they just got cleared and it's like their third shift. And I'm going, oh God, they're fixing to drive emergency to the hospital with me in the back. All right. And you can always tell because that paramedic or that EMT, you know, who normally doesn't wear their seatbelt in the back, suddenly starts putting their seatbelt on. <laughs> I'm going to sit right here. As there can be some fright and everything. And so... We have to drive gingerly in order to make sure that we are driving in a way that we're going to get that patient to the hospital in a, in a good amount of time, but also safely, professionally, and in a way that we're not going to be slamming on the brakes, overturning, overcorrecting, and stuff and causing injury. And we don't want to cause pain, fright, or anxiety to these patients. All right. So our driving skills, and these are the things that we need to practice on. The first thing is cornering, all right, is we don't want to turn too fast or anything because that's going to shift um, the center of gravity in that ambulance and it could cause where the person could 
um, could definitely fill up. Braking is one of the big things that a lot of new ambulance drivers really need to focus on is braking. It's about braking way too much, is riding the brakes, slamming on the brakes. A lot of times that vehicle can absolutely be slowed down by doing what? That's it, taking your foot off of the gas, it'll start to slow down. You're no longer applying um, speed to it. Accelerating, acceleration should be smooth. It shouldn't be that, you know, just, just pressing on it. And maintaining speed is one of the things we're gonna be working on. All right, so braking time. Your braking time is your total stopping distance, which includes your reaction time is where you identified the need for you to brake. But not only that, but it's also the time that it takes for your vehicle brakes to be applied, plus the distance that it has before it actually slows down to where you wanna be at. And so you have to make sure that you're accounting for all of that when you're applying your brakes. So what we need to do is known as the 2-4-12 rule. Maintain a two second interval between your ambulance and the vehicle head for speeds below 55 miles an hour. We have, of course have to increase that um, the more the faster that we get in our vehicle. Increase the following distance to four seconds when speeds get above uh, 55. Give yourself a 12 second visual lead in time. And so we have to be looking way ahead of what's going on and seeing you know, getting prepared. Are we coming up toward an intersection? Or is there vehicles in front of us and different things we need to be looking out for. Accelerate smooth and steadily. And so the vehicles that we drive in emergency vehicles, um, they're not fast accelerators. You're going to have to easily apply and let it build up speed as we get up. Doesn't do a whole lot of good to just slam on the gas as hard as you can. Yeah, it's gonna sound real awesome, but you ain't gonna go nowhere. It's just the engine working a lot harder. Maintain the appropriate speed and slower equals smoother. So gently getting up to the speed that we need to. The defensive driving means doing everything reasonably possible to avoid being involved in a preventable crash, regardless of what the law is and what other driver does or adverse driving conditions. You are all professional drivers, all right? Doesn't mean you got your CDL or anything, but what do you do for a living? You are an ambulance driver. I know everybody kind of goes, I'm not an ambulance driver. I've seen people, man, like it, like they want to fight and everything. I know it says paramedic on my little tag and everything, but what do I do as part of my job responsibilities? You drive an ambulance, your office drives, all right? No way around it, all right? now. If you're a flight paramedic and you're a, you, but you gotta get there somehow, all right? Um, you're gonna be in an ambulance at least for part of that, all right? Everybody's gonna be involved in ground operations sometime. And so part of our job as EMS folks is we're gonna have vehicle operation. We are professional at what we do. And so we wanna make sure that when we're driving and everything, that we're driving within a standard of care that is gonna be safe for you, your partner, that patient and the general public. Anything that we do outside of that, you're negligent. We don't want to be negligent. Well, some of you might. So a safety cushion, empty space around the vehicle that allows identifying hazard, deciding response and reacting correctly. So we want to kind of keep a little cushion around our ambulance when we're driving. So one of the things I notice a lot of folks do is, so we're, we're coming up driving somewhere and we get to the to an intersection and we'll get right behind the car in front of us at a red light. Why is that a real bad idea? That's right, you can't get around them. You have to make sure that we're leaving enough of a cushion, enough of a space if we were to have an emergency response that we can get around. So we always have to be kind of looking ahead and make sure that we're maintaining that. Multiple responding units, and this can happen quite easily, is um, when we're maybe we're responding right behind the fire department or police, and sometimes all three of us are responding kind of together. It can be dangerous. Emergency units responding along, along the same route should maintain 300 to 400 feet of distance between them. 
So we shouldn't get right up behind the fire department's responding. We should leave a nice little safety cushion. To make sure the other motorists know there's more than one emergency unit in the area, use a different siren sound. So this is maybe, maybe you have to slow down a little bit and take a listen. You may have to turn your siren off to hear what they've got going on. Real easy with the fire department, they probably got that federal cue going, you know, going, and so we can pretty much choose whatever sound we have. But here's the thing. The fire department typically not only has their federal queue, they also have the same siren box that we have. And so we have to make sure that there's a distinguishment between that. Communicating with other drivers. <laughs> That's a good one, right? We communicate with our lights. So we communicate with other drivers using our lights, our horn, eye contact, and hand signals. So our hand signals don't always have to be the one in the picture. It can be um, just kind of waving a driver through or putting our hand up to stop, those different kind of things. And definitely communicating with our siren. But we also communicate with our lights, this isn't our emergency lights. This can be our turn signals, our headlights for flashing at other drivers and different things. So hopefully out of this class and everything, we should learn that how to avoid a crash to begin with. Hopefully we've got good preparation or learning good driving techniques, but if there is, it's just inevitable that we're gonna have a crash, the first thing we need to do is to reduce times three. Reduce your speed, reduce your angle of impact, and reduce the side and hardness of the object and so what this means is if I anticipate that I'm fixing to strike another vehicle, I should put on the brakes to reduce my speed and let off the gas. I reduce the angle of impact by turning my vehicle where I'm only clipping that car instead of striking it head on. Reduce the size and hardness of the object this is the same thing. So basic driving maneuvers is braking and stopping, making lane changes, passing, backing, parking, and turning are all of the things that we should be utilizing to make sure that what is what we do every day with our driving. So braking and stopping. To brake, we should pump the brakes gently but firmly. Now this is kind of an older, um, when the EVOC was written was back in the 90s. This has kind of changed now. Um, so braking and stopping, we really shouldn't be doing so much with the pumping of the brakes. Most vehicles now are, um, have anti-lock brakes that are in there. Check conditions to the rear and side and search 12 seconds ahead. As the best way to slow a vehicle down is not by braking, but actually letting off of the gas and allowing the vehicle to slow down naturally. We're making lane changes. We wanna plan ahead. And so as we're thinking about making a lane change, we signal by using our turn signal our intentions for other drivers and see if the, what their reactions are. Are they gonna slow down and let us come over? Gently steer into the new lane once we determine that it's clear. So passing on two lane roads, number one, visually clear the oncoming lane, all right? That we're looking 12 seconds ahead and that lane is getting clear for us. Change the lanes and accelerate past that vehicle smoothly pull back into that lane. All right, and so if we're gonna be passing stop traffic, we only pass after we know why the traffic is stopped. Backing, this is so important. So especially for us who work for EMS agencies and everything, a lot of the crashes and incidents that we have can be attributed to backing, um, backing an ambulance up. So use a ground guide at the left rear so they, we, can, we can watch them and see them in our, our, our mirror. Keep guide in view at all times. If you can't see that guide, you shouldn't be in reverse. Use your side mirrors and accelerate very, very slowly. You should absolutely make sure that you are using a backer anytime that we are backing. You should have a ground guide. 
urban driving can definitely create some challenges for us. The first thing is, is we're surrounded by traffic. As we've got traffic from vehicles and parked vehicles and everything. And so we want to make sure that we're looking out for those. We're going to be constantly changing speeds is because um, we can't drive at a constant speed. We're, we're going to have intersections clear, traffic that's going to be entering and exiting. So you must be at your peak of alertness to safely drive in heavily urban traffic. Your partner should be looking out for those potential threats. Your partner should operate the radio and any other equipment. All right. Keep on going here. I think I stopped for a reason. So, Kat and I, we've been looking at um, some of the, the different challenges that we see in urban driving. Um, rural driving has its own challenges as well. Um, we need to be alert for loose livestock and pets that could be out there. Be alert for bicyclists, school buses, and children waiting for those buses in those rural areas. Be alert for slow-moving vehicles such as tractors, farm equipment, trucks, and horses, and also buggies. Um, all those things can kind of be found out in our environment and stuff. So we want to make sure that we are most definitely looking out for all of that stuff when we're out and about in the country. All right, let's continue on. All right, so we kind of talked about just some basic driving and everything in the non-emergency mode. And so now what we're going to be looking at is operating in the emergency mode. All right, so our emergency driving is using clearly defined procedures in the operation of an ambulance when responding to a medical emergency, including the use of emergency signaling devices such as lights and sirens. And so we really want to make sure that we are driving um, absolutely as safely as possible whenever we are driving in that emergency mode. All right, so here we go, guys. Um, so when we're using our emergency lights and sirens, we are notifying other drivers that an emergency vehicle is approaching. When we are driving, we, I want everybody to understand this word here, is that we are requesting that the other drivers yield the right of way to the ambulance. We're requesting, we're just asking. Um, we're not forcing them to do that. So there's a physiologic response that actually happens when we are driving in the emergency mode. Um, we run to the ambulance, that increases the adrenaline rush, it increases tension, and that increased, um, with our sympathetic nervous system, increases potential driver problems because we're all uh, really boosted up there. So with, in regards to speed limits, we should follow our state laws and SOP guidelines for speed limits. You need to operate at speed, which provide the best ride, response, and patient care. Um, so when we're in the ambulance and everything, we want to make sure that we are um, able to drive our vehicle and everything, and we're able to operate our vehicle at a safe speed. So again, the law of due regard says a reasonably careful person performing similar duties and under similar circumstances would act in the same manner. So however we are operating that emergency vehicle, is we want to make sure that we are operating in a manner that's going to follow under the law of due regard. 60% of ambulance crashes occur at intersections with stop signs and traffic lights. All right. Um, there are voluntary standards created to clear intersections. Here's what those voluntary standards are. This is called the National Voluntary Consensus for the NVS, or NVC. So when we're um, approaching, the siren should be at well 300 feet prior to an intersection. The siren should be switched over to Yelp 150 feet prior to the intersection, and the brake to stop at the crosswalk line. All right, so we make sure we stop. 
Two blasts of the air horn. Stop, look, and make eye contact, and then we proceed. Continue the yelp mode. Proceed with the highest degree of care. Clear each lane prior to crossing and anticipate vehicles from entering from right and left. Once we've cleared the intersection, um, we're going to switch our siren from yelp back to wail. As part of this consensus, we want to anticipate multiple responding units and avoid passing stop vehicles on the right. We should never ever pass on the right as we should always pass on the left. Turn right after drivers on the right are aware of the ambulance. Anticipate left turns in front of the ambulance by oncoming traffic. As we want to anticipate that these drivers could be um, anxious and could be scared a little bit and we want to make sure that we are looking out for them as well. Beware of other intersection hazards. Intersections can be really, really terrible for us. And so one of the things we need to do is we've seen a lot of folks come up to an intersection and nobody's moving. We've got our lights on, we're blowing a horn and just nobody's getting out of our way. So we shouldn't just sit there and continue to force people to try to move for us. If nobody's moving, the best thing to do is just to just shut down, go into the non-emergency mode of driving, once the light is changed, proceed through it, then go back to the emergency driving mode. So driving against traffic should be avoided at all costs. Do not enter the opposing traffic lane until all oncoming vehicles are aware of ambulance presence. Do not enter a one-way street against traffic until all opposing traffic has yielded the right-of-way. So be very, very careful when driving against traffic. It should really be avoided at all costs. So some adverse conditions. You must learn how to adjust your driving style to the existing conditions. So we um, have to take a look and make, all right, is the, the traction where it needs to be on the road? And do I have good vision? So with traction, con conditions that affect traction are rain, snow and ice, high wind, and leaves as well. We don't really think about leaves so much, but it can affect our traction. So with the rain, um, rain can affect tr uh, traction in three ways. Hydroplaning in as little as one sixteenth of an inch of water on the road surface can lead to hydroplaning. So brakes can become wet and less effective when it's raining. Standing water, uh, when only on one side of the vehicle goes through the water, the vehicle will tend to pull in that direction of the water. So be careful when it's raining. Uh, take the following actions. Slow down before hitting the water. This will lessen the splashing and reduce the effects of hydroplaning, giving you more control. And gently apply your brakes for a few moments as you exit the deeper puddles to heat the brakes, shoes, and dry them. Until the brakes are dry, you will notice that it takes more foot pressure to stop the ambulance. So for snow and ice, um, they form an extremely slick barrier between your tires and the roadway. Extreme caution must be taken when driving on snow and ice to avoid sliding when turning, braking, and accelerating. Remember that in cold weather, bridges and shaded roadways freeze first. Often this freezing is nearly invisible and all bridges and shaded areas must be approached with caution. So high winds, crosswinds can blow the vehicle off the road or across the center line, particularly in curves and corners, and especially when it's raining, snowing, or icy and traction with the road is already reduced. Wind shifts occurs as you pass buildings, travel through an underpass, or pass large trucks. These shifts can toss the ambulance first one way and then another. Reduced speeds will lessen the effects on these wind shifts. So um, this one's really important here in North Dakota as we're driving on a transfer, we're out in a big open area and everything, and on a good windy day as it can kind of blow us around. Perfectly acceptable for you to slow your vehicle down and so that, that way the wind doesn't take the, as big of a toll as it, as it would. So wet leaves on the roadway can become as slick as ice or snow. If you cannot avoid driving through areas of wet leaves, slow down and treat them as you would a large patch of ice. Good advice. So our vision. Conditions that affect vision are rain and fog. It's going to make our visibility limited. Night driving and just the vehicle itself is going to produce some blind spots for us. So driving at night. Darkness conceals hazards. You must make decisions based on incomplete information. It's more difficult to judge the speed and position of another vehicle because you don't have distance or shadows as reference points. Your peripheral vision is reduced if you smoke, so good reason to stop. 
This makes it more difficult to judge the speed and position of other vehicles, especially at night. Adequate highway lighting is limited, especially here in North Dakota. Glare from roadside lighting and oncoming vehicle headlights can absolutely impair your visibility. So vision night techniques. So this is something that's gonna improve our vision. Dim the dash and panel lights, dim for better vision, but always have enough light to read the speedometer. Reduce your speed so that you can stop within the visible distance. Drive within the range of your headlights. So just drive within what you can see. Increase side distance by keeping the headlights clean and properly aimed and the windshield clean as well so you can see out of it. Watch beyond the headlights on or near the roadway for slow moving or unlighted vehicle curves, T intersections, road obstructions or defects, trains, pedestrians and animals. Keep your eyes moving so that your blind spot does not hide objects ahead. So a little more um, vision stuff, especially when driving at night. Hopefully these are helping out just a little bit. So let's see how we're doing. Um, don't move immediately from a brightly lit room to a dark vehicle and begin driving. And so one of the things that I like here is um, the company is really good about keeping the, the, the ambulance garages, um, they, they lower the lighting down at night, um, not only to save electricity, but also it does help with being able to adjust our eyes to the light as we're getting prepared to drive. So um, if your company has real bright garages, think about dimming them down so it gets you prepared for night driving. All right, so avoid, it gets your eyes a chance to adjust to the darkness. Avoid looking directly into glaring headlights of oncoming vehicles. The human eye takes about seven seconds to fully recover from being blinded by bright light. At 60 miles per hour, your ambulance will travel 616 feet in seven seconds. Wow, that's scary. So we want to make sure that we're adjusting our eyes. So during rain and fog, it affects our visibility in two ways. It reduces it and it also provides glare. So the vision in our vehicle is we should make sure that we have our windshield wipers are operating. And that's why you ought to change your windshield wipers out when it starts to, to smear and everything and they're not working. Make sure that we're using our visors to help keep the sun out of your eyes. One of the things that I highly recommend if you're gonna be working and everything is you should bring a pair of sunglasses to work with you. Um, make sure that your headlights are in good shape and make sure that you're using your side view mirrors and that you're able to adjust them prior to driving. So crash avoidance, plan ahead to avoid a crash. All of our vehicles, everything inside of our vehicles should be secured for transport. As um, do we have spare oxygen bottles and different things, those need to be made sure that they're secure. All passengers, including you, need to make sure that you're wearing your seatbelt. Mentally prepare yourself. I am about to, to be in a crash. Maintain rear and side space cushion and use a ground guide to avoid a crash. And use a ground guide basically um, for those rear collision crashes. Vehicle malfunctions can include tire blowout, brake failure, steering failure, a stuck accelerator or a release hood that can flap up. So learn to anticipate that these things can happen and what you need to do to control that vehicle if this does occur. All right, so lesson nine, and I think this is the final one, is gonna be on special considerations. The emergency vehicle operator is in charge again of the passenger, the crew, the vehicle. Fire apparatus will typically have an officer in the right seat who is in charge, but every vehicle should have a person in charge. And so the driver is responsible for driving. The person in the passenger seat um, going to the call is responsible for navigating and communicating. We need to think about that we are responsible for families not only transporting, ensuring safety, communications, and assistance, but not only the, every person has a family, your partner has a family, you have a family, the patient has a family, and the general public all have a family, and we need to be driving safe for them, okay? Let's make sure we're doing a good job for them. So here are some potential dangers. We can be, um, there could be fires that we're going to, it can be a hazmat incident, we have to be looking out for crowds, violence, acts, traffic, and down power lines. So hazmat, 
All right. And so the good rule of thumb is with hazmat is if we're responding, especially in EMS, we should be able to be far enough back that we should be able to cover that entire scene with our thumb as we put it out. If we are any closer to that and we can't cover it with our thumb, we are too close. We only go into hazmat and our responsibility is we, are, we get all of our patients in the cold zone. We are never going to expose ourselves or our unit to potentially hazmat situation. Fires. One of the things is, is we're going to be called to, to go out and to assist the fire department with fires, providing medical assistance. So we want to park a safe distance away from the fire because there are the potential for explosions and other hazards, but also to allow for fire apparatus to come in to be able to hook up up their hoses and to do all of their, their fire ground operations. We want to make sure that we're definitely clear for them to be able to do their fire ground operations while being close enough to be able to provide medical support. Uh, when you're on a fire scene, um, the person that you are going to liaison with is going to be the, the scene commander. Crowds. Crowds can be um, unpredictable and dangerous, um, especially during an emergency. Um, um, tensions can run high during this kind of stuff. Um, so be very careful, especially when responding to, to things like bars, um, we're responding to concerts or other large gatherings and things. Um, so be very, very careful. Um, so we can have an incident um, where a lot of folks are around. And so be, be very mindful of crowds and also about operating your vehicle around crowds is that we don't hit anybody. Violent acts. Um, we should um, make sure that we are far enough away from the scene so that we are not potential victims of a violent act and are only allowed to come into the scene when we are cleared by law enforcement. Down power lines. Um, so if we encounter down power lines, we should assume even if that power line is down and um, somebody tells you that the electricity is off, we should assume that it is live, that it's a live power line. Um, we should not be trying to drive up to it or around it or anything. We should only be cleared to go around down power lines when law enforcement or fire or another agency says it's okay to do so. So when we are parking our vehicle and we're placing it out on the roadway, we want to make sure that we're doing it safely, that we can manage the flow of traffic. We have got our vehicle parked in such a manner that it's going to be easy for us to depart. We want to make sure that we have a good distance um, from the scene or the patient as where we're parked at and so we can have a good cushion of safety. We're going to take a look at that. The incident commander should direct all vehicles at the scene as they're responsible for that. So diagram number one. All right, there is a vehicle that maybe you have a patient that's right there in the red vehicle. And we want to park our ambulance to be able where traffic can come around. But we want to make, be careful as how we park it. Is we need to be considering is where we're parking it at, are we going to be able to get our patient back to that ambulance without having to put the patient at risk for traffic, all right? So, we're going to be, so what I would do with this diagram, instead of parking right here where my rear door is facing right where traffic is turning, I would pull my vehicle in front of the, of the parked vehicle or that wrecked vehicle. That way, if the person hits anything, they're going to hit that vehicle and my ambulance is still protected. All right, so diagram number two, all right? This is a good thing. We have the... Uh, the wrecked car or the thing, we can park right there and we're blocking traffic and we're making traffic go all the way around to give us a good cushion to operate near that vehicle. In diagram three, all right, we've got two units responding. All right, one unit parks in a, such a manner, which is typically kind of cool when fire does this, as they bark, block the lanes that they'll allow the other traffic to flow around and we could park our vehicle up here so we got a good cushion of safety to operate within. Diagram number four is right, so we have a, a, a traffic thing that's going on. We have four lanes of traffic, all right, and we have the accident which is over here in the far lane, all right. So the traffic is coming up. We want to make sure we got our vehicle parked in such a manner as that we can keep this traffic from going around that they're going to be forced to stop, but also allowing this traffic to go around us as well. So utilizing flares, if we are going to be using lighting a flare and everything, um, we're going to open it up. We're going to twist it for the striker igniter to, to work. 
And if we are going to be using flare placement, we're going to place the first flare at 10 feet past the vehicle to stop, and then another one at 100 feet. We'll put a flare and then an additional one at 100 feet. So you'll need three flares. And the same thing is going to happen when we're using a warning triangle. But be careful when we're using flares, um, especially when we could, uh, there's a possibility that there could be um, leaking fuel or other flammable sources. So in summary, coordinate EVOC procedures with your company's standard operating procedures. Personnel should not have to guess at action to take for any situation. Um, right along should have to have supervisory checks. So we should be checking our driving every now and then. And uh, we should at least annually be doing refresher driving. Um, what is recommended after you take your initial EVOC course is to do an EVOC refresher, which is about a two to four hour refresher course. And you should do this about every two years. All right, if there are no questions, we're gonna take a look at actually performing the run. We should be ready to go when we're operating our emergency vehicle. You should come to work prepared. If you're ill or you're under the effects of anything, you don't want, you don't want to be driving around and potentially not having your mind in the best place that it needs to be. We want to make sure we inspect our vehicles. We want to be mindful of intersections. So we're on the run and everything, but we're mapping or we're preparing for our run. We're mindful about intersections and how we're going to be utilizing them. So when we're clearing the controlled intersection, we're going to start, um, we're, it's kind of a little review. Siren to well at 300 feet, the yelp at 150 feet. Remove the foot from the accelerator. You're going to start braking and give two blasts of the air horn. Look left, look front, right, and then clear left again. Make eye contact with all drivers. When all clear, proceed under 10 miles per hour and continue with Yelp through the intersection. Here are some cautions. Watch for drivers who don't hear warnings because there are plenty of people we may not hear. You have folks that are elderly or they could be hearing impaired. Do not enter the intersection controlled by another emergency vehicle. Avoid passing on the right. I say don't pass on the right at all. Be aware of hazards at intersections. So here's a difficult in, um, situation is you have the, the thing and you have a road that's entered right there. And so the best place to park is, we're not gonna be able to get around to park right here, is so we may have to go in front to park or we have to leave it here. You're gonna have some situations like that. You need to park in the best place that's gonna give us a good safety cushion for when we're working out through the roadways but also in such a manner that we can get back out into the roadway to uh, leave the scene. This, folks, is the end of our course today as far as the classroom portion. Um, there is two other parts to this course to complete it. Um, the next phase is taking the uh, written. There is a 25 um, question test, super easy to take. You'll need to take that and turn that back into me. And the last part is the road course, which you can take, um, just let me know and we'll get you set up. Once you've completed all three of those parts, you will get an EVOC certificate. All right, folks, so thank you so much for watching and we'll get you guys all set up um, to be able to take the, the road course and everything. Um, this um, lesson today will be available at all of the stations on all the computers. I'm going to make a little video and put it on there. And it'll be real easy for you guys to watch as a review and everything. We'll probably use this for the review for the next couple of years. So um, the road course will be um, starting at about noon today here at the South Station for anybody who'd like to come out and, and take the, the road course today. Or it'll also be available tomorrow at noon here at the South Station. And again, it'll be available all day on Thursday. So guys and gals, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon. Thank you again for being so patient. Bye-bye.